uh, minister to those that are here. As I play the background, and your Holy Spirit delivers the message, Lord God, that I may be also edified by what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Our scripture for this morning is Isaiah 45, verse 7. Isaiah 45, verse 7. And it says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Amen? Amen. So that scripture, it sounds self-evident of what God does, but what sticks out is when the scripture says, and I create evil. So a couple of weeks ago, I did a sermon on the characteristics of God. And one of the things out of his characteristics that I didn't bring up, because it is not his characteristics, is evil. So when you look at the scripture, it sounds confusing. Or it sounds like people can be conflicted with contradiction of who God is. So we have to... In order for us to understand what the scripture says, we have to delve into the research, the resources, and what the context is saying. So as I looked up this word in the Old Testament, in the, uh, the original word for evil is create calamity. And it's not evil, it's calamity. But, to be fair, when you look at that scripture and then you take it in the storyline of what it's actually talking about, you think of uh, Moses coming out of Egypt. When he left Egypt, God spoke to him and says, I want you to go back to Egypt and talk to Pharaoh because I want to set my people free. Mm -hmm. And Moses said, he's not going to let the people go. It's going on and on and on. And God says, it is I am to help him. That is who you're going to tell him. I will harden his heart so he can see who I am. So when the scripture talks about God hardening the Pharaoh's heart, that is the calamity. And it's, it's kind of like if I want somebody to uh, motivate someone, there's got to be some kind of thing that's going to be uncomfortable for that person to do, for, and, and to get the end results at the end. So, again, when people look at the scripture and they say, evil, 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 why would God allow evil? They would say, why doesn't he prevent evil? And why doesn't he stop? But well, we go back to the scriptures and we think about what the storyline is. Because people, when they think of people, Evil, they think of like Aldor Hitler, they think of uh, Dylan Loop, the American trade, uh, slave trade, they think of the Oklahoma bombings, 9 11, uh, Jim Jones, you know, the uh, uh, Margaret Sanger, who created genocide, well, she didn't create genocide, but established genocide in the black community. And Andrew Jackson with the Trail of the Tears with the Indians. So, yeah, there's a lot of evil. But, again, when we look at uh, the scripture in and of itself, we have to understand that when it comes to evil and why God allows it, it's kind of like if you was at the beach and it's 90 degrees outside and you get under the, the umbrella to cool off, but as soon as that umbrella blows, you feel all that heat. Okay, so now the cloud comes and it starts getting dark. It gets kind of cool. So if you think about it, the absence of heat is cold. So if you go out here in, in 20 degree weather and you're freezing, you come in here and it's warm out, because it's not that there's no 
Cold, it's not that cold doesn't exist. It's just that it's the absence of heat. Just like light. If you go in the dark, it's the absence of light. So this, this is a scientific evidence of there's no such thing as there's no such thing as heat. There is heat, it's just the absence of it. It's the same thing with evil. The absence of God is evil. So when people do things, you have to look at their situation. Do they have God in their life? And if they do have God in their life, where is the light that they shine or any evidence of how they walk, how they speak, how they behave? What's their reaction towards other people? Do they have compassion? Are they thinking about everybody else but themselves? Not to say they can't think about themselves, but are they actually putting other people to become a priority? Because that's the number one thing about God, is when you put other people in priority towards you, against you, not against, but before yourself, you automatically have a God conscience. If I see somebody that I don't like, that I, dis that I have a disagreement with, I still see the God inside them to have some kind of compassion towards that person in order for our relationship to function or to agree to disagree. But we still have to function in this society. And I think what happens is a lot of people misunderstand scripture when it comes to that scripture where it talks about evil. Now, as I mentioned about, let's talk about the what is. Because when it talks about God having calamity, there's a reason why he stirs up the pot for people to uh, get the end results of his will, so to speak. We talk about, I can talk about uh, Abraham's son Joseph and how his older brothers sold him into slavery. That's it. But what if when Joseph was in Egypt and he didn't have a God card, he didn't have conviction that pricked himself, pricked his, his spirit to say, this is right and this is wrong. And the captain of Pharaoh's uh, God, his wife wanted to sleep with Joseph. And Joseph said, you know what? Nobody's around. I'm in the dark. There's no light. Let's close the door. And he sleeps with the Pharaoh's captain's God. Now, the end result is go to jail, he might get his head chopped off. If you know the story and how Joseph prevented to be in her sight, he always tried to run away from her, run away from her, run away from her. At the end result, he did go to jail, but he found our favor in one of the people that had a position. So he ended up uh, deciphering dream, dreams, he ended up becoming a, having a position in Egypt. And when there was a famine, he prevented the famine because he told Pharaoh, this is what you need to do to prevent this famine from happening. And he also got his brethren to come back so they could be fed. So, but if he just slept with his wife, none of that would have happened. You wouldn't even hear about the story. And probably half of the Egyptian population would have died. But because God put it in his heart to run away from that woman, it saved a lot of people from falling into There was calamity that God created, but it was because of Joseph's due diligence of who he served that people can see the God in him that other people would be able to survive. Overcome temptation. And overcome. Speaking of temptation, what if Jesus gave in to that temptation? Oh Bow down to, to the person that offered him everything that he can see. What would happen to us? Where would our salvation in and of itself be? Yes. There'd be no us. There'd be no us. There absolutely. So, we also can talk about King David. And this is the God after, me, uh, after 
is the man after God's heart? And how evil was the thought process he sees this woman who he knew was married, ended up sleeping with her, got her pregnant, tried to cover it, couldn't cover it, so he ended up killing the husband of Bathsheba. And the suffering was his people, his five, four, five, five children, they all died. So there is what I believe when it comes to evil, evil is this type of virus that affects everybody. One person, it goes apart. You know, we have this notion of saying that we're good when every single one of us falls short to the grace of God. And if we all fall short, if, by knowing that, it puts our arrogance in check, it puts our ego in check, it puts our, our our immor immorality in check, mm -hmm. our immortality in check. So when we look at that, we have this conviction that pricks us, that God has already ordained us to know what our consciousness is, uh, or our compass, our moral compass is, to know that what's right and what's wrong. So, but being human, we turn the lights off and we do whatever because our arrogance and ego gets in the way and we can get away from it. But the farther away from you, you are from God, evil is always going to have that opportunity to knock on the door. And I think what happens is that we we allow this, this opportunity to uh, exist in our lives and think that we can get away with it. You know, but as I said before, evil uh, is always going to be present in our lives. And it's up to us to know what grace is, what love is, what compassion is, what kindness is to overcome that. You know, when, when God took the human form to become one of us and to experience what we, our weaknesses and what we go through, you know, then he, he knows exactly what it is to be a human being. So we can't even use that as an excuse to say, oh, I'm just human, I make mistakes. Yeah, you make mistakes, but if you don't recognize mistakes, it's not a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why when it comes to conviction, conviction has you, has you think, conviction is what, Tricks your soul to understand this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, what you do with that is up to you. What you do with the consciousness of what is right and what's wrong is up to you. And every single one, even though we're born with sin, we know we have this good consciousness in us to know what is right and what is wrong. And we have to understand that, you know, the excuses that we put on the table is not going to be good enough for us. But it's mercy. Yeah. And to know what his mercy is, it means and what it does, it allows you to face your weaknesses. It allows you to look at your temptations and the evil that causes you to fall from grace to get back up on, on your feet and march and keep walking forward mm -hmm. to the God that we serve. Yes. You know, so again, I um, want to know, I want to people to know that it's not about uh, the characteristics of God when it comes to evil, but the discipline and the, the direction and the, the characteristics of trying to get you to do right from your own. You know, the issue of, like when they talk about repent, it's not so much about saying sorry, it's about recognizing where you went wrong, and how do I go about turning it around yes. and getting it right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the actual uh, meaning of it. I know a lot of people that beat their wives and, and say sorry all the day long. You know, beat their children all the day long. And buying toys and gifts 
and going to pay jewelers, that don't that don't solve the problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So again, now you a person that is that uh, wants to go to counseling because he loves his wife, a person that wants therapy because he loves his children, yeah. you know, that's the turnabout. That recognizes the problem and also puts action to his flaws that where where he can where he can change the direction and the dynamics of it. That's what repentance is all about. Now, you take that same situation and you look at our lives, and it, you don't have to be, because a, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, I'm not a, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't, that has nothing to do with it. It's just, being a human being has its flaws in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't come with a, uh, we wasn't born with a toolbox to get this, this life right. You know what I mean? So, in and, of, in and of itself, we do have guidance on, uh, again, with the moral compass when it comes to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't have to pick up a book. Everybody knows that do unto others as you would do to yourself. I got people at work, at school, at, and at, at, uh, at the supermarket that know that, and they don't even know the scripture. Uh -huh. They just know that that's the right thing to do. That's the moral compass that we have in us that God has already ordained with us. So when it comes to that, you do what's right. You try to do what you can. But at the end of the day, you look at yourself and you wonder, is this what I need to do? Where do I need to uh, fit in with my salvation, with my walk, with my ability to better not only myself, but my community, uh, people at work, people at school, the people that I am um, involved in, so they can see the God in you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say anything about God, but your actions say a lot more than what you actually say. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, right. you know, it's one thing to, to talk about God and preach and, and do all that, but I live something totally different than what I'm saying, then I'm wasting your time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm wasting everybody's time, Deacon's time, that's his time, your time, you know, and I'm just going through the motions, you know, and I'm, I'm even actually wasting God's time. So, again, when it comes to our walk, our priority is God in and of himself and everything around you that betters not just the community, but yourself. So, when it comes to evil, sometimes God brings about the calamity in ourselves to prevent us from going down the path that's deep, that dig us deeper into the hole. So what I mean by that is that if I was a gambler and I took my mortgage and I went to, to Exeter, or Connecticut, you know, to the casino, and instead of going to Gamblers Anonymous, I go to the casino and I stop gambling. Mm -hmm. So I lose my house, I lose my job, I lose my wife, I lose the dignity of the church. I, everything, I just lost everything. The calamity, God allowed for all that to happen so I can recognize eventually, as I hit rock bottom, I can't go anywhere else, eventually, I have to wake up and say, hey, this is my doing. In the beginning, I'll stop blaming everybody. It's the deacon's fault because he didn't let me borrow money. You wouldn't take it. You know, this one didn't want to give me rent. The house is falling apart. But I'm the one that put gas in my car to drive to Connecticut. Right, right, right. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, but again, once the calamity has happened and I recognize my flaws and it's all my doing, that's when we can't stop. Because mm -hmm. now I can go to counseling, I can go to gambling, gamblers and not, I can do all sorts of things. Now I gotta stop. Yeah, I'm starting over from scratch. But the grace of God doesn't have uh, uh it, it's not a race. Whether I'm the last one to make it across the finish line or the first one, I make it across the finish line yep. regardless. That's the end result of of where I need to be. So, 
with that being said, I just want to leave you knowing that wherever you're at in life, God is going to direct you to where you need to be. Amen. But you have to understand that it's his calling on you that you have to listen to. I can I can say, oh, you know, you you stop doing poetry, you need to do writing. That's not my decision, that's right. God's decision. You know, or God would just say, you know, do this and do that to enhance what you bring to the table. Amen. You know, but again, we all have to understand and listen to the Spirit of God in order for us to make our journey a lot more easy. There's going to be obstacles, there's going to be bumps and bruises and all that, but the point that I'm getting at is that we get up and we still keep moving forward. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father God, we just want to thank you for this day. We thank you for loving us the way you love us that no one else could. We thank you for the mercy and the grace and the goodness and the kindness and, and all the things that, you're, that you've already established before the world was ever even created. God. That you had us in your heart and your mind before we were even born. We just want to thank you for that, Lord God, that no matter what this world throws at us, Lord God, you still have all the steps for each and every one of us here. And if there's anyone here that would like to know this Christ that I serve, please raise your hands. Praise God. Again, we just want to thank you. Same amen. 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 So, before we leave, I want to. Uh, my nephew gave me a piece of paper about this job opportunity for anybody that is interested in working. Uh, 